quantum mechanics uh, doesn't just describe the very small, it describes the entire universe. And it is the most accurate theory that we have. The problem with quantum mechanics is it doesn't make any sense. And when Niels Bohr and all the folks in Copenhagen came up with a convention for everyone to, to say, shut up and do the math, don't think about it, uh, they came up with this notion called the Copenhagen Convention, where they said that, okay, uh, we've got this equation, the Schrodinger equation, and a guy named Born figured out that if you square the symbol psi from the Schrodinger equation, you get these probabilities. Uh, they're sometimes called probability density, and that is going to predict the likelihood of something happening. And when a measurement is made, and what a measurement is, is essentially an observation, um, and there's an issue of a conscious mind being involved or not, uh, then this probability wave collapses and uh, something happens. And it can be uh, a whole variety of things. And the problem is, it's one of the stinky things about it, is that it just happens and there's no cause. It's acausal. Now, the reason that's stinky is that could be but it's not like everything else we know of, so it's stinky. It smells funny. The other problem with the Copenhagen Convention is it's very arbitrary. It, what is a measuring device isn't clear, and once a measurement is made, the experiment is over, but you can take a measurement after that with another device, measuring device, which can be a human being or a laboratory instrument or whatever, and it's not clear what's going on there. Um, and everybody understood that. It didn't make sense, and the idea was shut up. Don't talk about it. Do the math, and we'll advance the science. And that's what happened. Uh, but it's not a very acceptable um, answer to what's going on, which in a way you could think of as metaphysics. But having a reasonable model of what's going on is pretty important. I mean, there was a time where they didn't think we would ever be able to know whether there were atoms or not just because they were too inaccessible, and they thought there was no way we could actually tell. And uh, they said it's not a good idea to think about these things. Well, it actually is, even if you don't have a way of measuring them, because you learn more about these things called atoms, these hypothetical things, and then you come up with ways of measuring them, which actually happened and eventually led to things like the atomic force microscope and things like that, which actually saw pictures of atoms. And I was taught you could never see an atom, and Scientific American came up with a big picture of that on their front page, and I rushed to my professor and said, we have a picture of an atom, and he said, get out of my office, that's ridiculous, that will never happen, and I held it up, and he said, give me that. Well, that's my point, though. It's, it's a good idea to look at things, even if at the time we can't determine whether one interpretation is right or the other. So Copenhagen Convention essentially um, says, okay, things kind of happen for no reason, and then we measure them and then the wave collapses, and don't think about what happens after that because we don't do that. We just don't do that because it leads to contradictions and don't, don't think about it. Now, other people have done stuff like, it's called quantum logic. They say, oh yeah, we can make perfect sense of quantum mechanics. Uh, what we're going to do is we're just going to say the rules of logic are different. So that's pretty cool. And there's a guy named David Bohm who I really like a lot. I've read some of his cool books. Um, it's not whiskey, it's just water. Um, and uh, he came up with a, a model kind of along the lines of Einstein. Einstein didn't want there to be any hidden variables, things hidden inside there. And Bohm actually came up with that. But the problem is, and the problem with a lot of these uh, interpretations of quantum mechanics is, is that you end up with something called non-locality. Now, here's what non-locality is. It's a stinky thing. And Bohm, uh, unfortunately for him, came up with something pretty complicated mathematically, extra terms and all this, but also ended up with non-locality. And non-locality basically says that to make sense of the world, we have to be able to send signals faster than light. And there isn't a, a hard and fast rule that says you can't. You can't send information faster than light. Um, so you can technically send uh, signals, superluminal, faster than light signals, but it's stinky because 
from what we understand about the universe, it could be, but it doesn't sound right. It's sort of like collapse of the wave function. This, uh, from the Schrodinger equation, that psi square deal, it's stinky. It doesn't make sense. And, um, from the Schrodinger equation, I forgot to mention uh, that it's not in the math. It's not there. The Schrodinger equation has nothing about collapse of the wave function. So what Bohm was stuck with, and a lot of other interpretations are stuck with, is this non-locality thing. And here's how it works very, very simply. Um, if you take uh, two photons, those are particles of light, and they start in the same place, and they, they're said to be entangled. And what this means is, is that they're going to be connected in a very interesting way. Now, you let them go really far apart, and then you measure them. You measure them for whether their polarization axis, whatever that is, is going to be going horizontally or vertically. And what happens is, when you measure one, it affects the other. And what's happened is, a fellow by the name of Bell, it's called Bell's theorem, mathematically showed by the rules of quantum mechanics that it isn't possible for these photons to have definitive states. Mathematically, it makes no sense. But when you measure one, you affect the other, and it appears to be instantaneous. And Alan Aspect is uh, the first guy that did an experiment to show this, to show empirically what um, Bell's theorem showed, and there have been a lot of other people. So it may not be instantaneous, but it's way, way faster than light, and pretty much what we're seeing is instantaneous signals. That's non-locality, and that's stinky. Uh, it doesn't feel right. And this is what Einstein had a problem with. Einstein's problem was with probabilistic effects, non-deterministic effects, and also non-local effects, and was trying to get a way around uh, that. So <clears throat> what happens is, is that there is this interpretation, but it's also a mathematical model uh, of quantum mechanics, uh, so it's rigorous, called the many worlds theory or the many worlds interpretation. And uh, it, it basically, not just basically, it takes care of all of these issues. Now, you might not like the result, but I don't think the result is stinky. It's just mind-blowing. But it's the only interpretation of quantum mechanics that I know of that takes care of all of these issues. So uh, let me give you an example of some of the problems that we have with quantum mechanics in some more detail before I go into... Um, many worlds. There is a, um, a, a famous uh, thought experiment, Schrodinger's cat. Now, when I was talking about those two photons traveling far apart, what was proven mathematically and, uh, well, and empirically is that it isn't possible for those photons to have a definitive state it, it leads to logical absurdities. And the same thing occurs with a, a, an event such as putting a cat in a room with a radioactive source which could cause that cat, let's say, 50% uh, chance that the cat will die because the radioactive source uh, causes a poison to be released um, into the room, or it doesn't. Now, the thing is, according to quantum mechanics, by the same mathematical logic that we had with those photons, it has been shown that it makes no sense. It's inconsistent with quantum mechanics, with the math, for that cat to have a definitive state of being alive or dead. The only thing that makes sense is that the cat is in a state of being alive and dead. And this is one of the interesting features of quantum mechanics. It's bizarre. And then what happens is, if an experimenter then enters the room, then he can find out if the cat is alive or dead. And that's sort of called collapse of the wave function. But what makes it weird is, if you put another enclosure around that inner room and there's another observer, now, inside the room, the cat is neither alive nor dead because that outside observer has not actually made the observation. And 
That is bizarre. And that's what? Just do it this way. And everyone thought, well, that's pretty bizarre, but we'll just do it that way for now. Okay? So, <clears throat> so that's, a, that's a problem right off the bat. Now, and how the hell are you going to explain stuff like that? Now, the other thing has to do with the, uh, the famous double slit experiment. Now, the way that works is, is that you have a double slit, and you can put, let's say, photons, particles of light again, uh, through that slit. Now, if you put just one photon through, just one, let it go all the way through and go to a screen, and then you keep shooting photons, one after the other, and you don't make any observations about what's going on. You just kind of let it happen. So you let it happen, and then you look at the screen, and you see a pattern of which is called interference. And what this means is the particle acted like a wave. But then, if you have these two slits, and you put a detector by one of those slits to detect if the particle goes through one slit or the other, now, you know the particle goes through one slit or the other, so if the detector sees the particle, it went through that slit, and if it doesn't see the particle, it went through the other slit, so you know what it did. Now, if you do that, and you look at the detector to see what happens, you don't get an interference pattern. Nope. You get what would be a, a ballistic pattern, like these were bullets going through. Huh. That's interesting. So by making the observation you change the result. But it gets even more weird. If you have this detector, and it detects what's going to happen, but you don't look. You destroy the detector, so it isn't possible to get that information. But the photons have all struck the screen before you destroy the detector. Guess what? What you see is an interference pattern again. Now, the only way to sort of explain this, well, one way to explain it, all the ways are bizarre, is to say that essentially something traveled backward to time through time to change the result. And that's freaking weird. But there's a way to explain all of this stuff without any inconsistencies. And that's the many world interpretation. So here's how it works. Essentially, our universe or our world exists as waves of probability. And whenever there is an interaction between particles, a quantum interaction, it doesn't involve a measuring device, it doesn't involve a consciousness. Whenever an interaction occurs, then the universe splits into separate worlds. And it continues to do so throughout time so that everything that can happen does happen. Now, it seems totally bizarre, but how does it solve some of these problems? Well, let's take a look at what we mentioned with the two photons going far apart, the, the non-locality, the, the signaling faster than light. Well, you see, what they say is these photons, they're entangled. There's something called um, coherence. They're connected. But once we make a measurement, what happens is our universe splits. It splits into all the possibilities of how that photon could be. This way or this way. In other cases, there may be more options. It just splits. And when it does, there is no signal that travels faster than light. Separate universes are created. How does that solve the Schrodinger's cat issue? Well, what happens is that cat is going to be in a state of superposition. That's going to be coherence. But when that person, so the cat really is alive and dead. It is not one thing or the other yet. Now, to the cat, the cat is both alive and dead in separate universes. But what's happened is the person that's going in hasn't split yet. 
Now that might sound really bizarre, but you see, the cat has already had its interaction. But there's a, a point here where that person coming into the room hasn't split yet, so the cat exists both in a live, a dead state. Now, that may sound totally bizarre, but it's beautiful. Mathematically, it's beautiful. There's no added math to this. The universe, everything that can happen does happen. It's all predetermined from the very beginning, whatever that means, and it all just flows out like a river. Now, in a previous video, I mentioned it's scary as hell. If you think about it deeply, I'm not going to do that today, okay? But what I, what I do want to get to um, is this notion of these patterns of splitting. Because what happens is that person goes in the room and there's an interaction with a photon and from the cat and he can see the cat is alive and dead and that person splits into two. One universe where the cat is alive, another one the universe where the cat is dead. Um, and each of those observers are unaware that they split. And the cat is unaware that it's dead in another universe. Of course, the dead cat is not aware of anything. So, that's pretty cool. Now, it may not make total sense because I'm doing my best. I decided not to go with diagrams or shit like that. Just trying to give you a flavor of this. But there's a real elegance to this. Um, simply because all of these problems go away. Now, let me explain another problem. It's not probabilistic. This is a deterministic universe. There's a probability associated with uh, psi, psi squared, for each of these different options, and all of them get realized. And so, if all of them get realized, then it's deterministic, not probabilistic. So, this is pretty cool. Also very cool, um, there's no uh, signaling faster than light, and essentially uh, what that means is there's no non-locality. It addresses Einstein's concerns. Perhaps he wouldn't have liked it, but it does address his concerns. His concern was with the fact of probabilism, cause without effect, and he also was concerned with uh, non-locality, along with some other things about quantum mechanics, but that's principally it. Okay, so what's the downside here? Um, one of the issues is conservation of mass, energy. Um, now, this is stinky, I will admit it. Um, some people have said, well, you know, um, conservation of energy and mass are uh, only required within a universe, not in a multiverse, or within a world, not in a universe. Uh, they're using the same argument for inflationary model, uh, where universes are created and lots of energy and mass are created out of nothing. Um, so that's a way out of that. But that, I will admit that that's stinky. Um, What's not really stinky but is an issue is, is that not too many people have worked on this mathematically. Everett was basically trashed by Bohr. Uh, he just killed him. That's why uh, Everett, who developed many worlds as a, a PhD thesis for John Wheeler, uh, left the field of physics. And there's only been a few people that have picked it up. But, but mathematically, um, if this is it, and no one's really quite uh, proved this yet, is they would like to see if this is it, a derivation that shows how out of the Schrodinger equation you can come up with Born's idea of probabilities by squaring psi. Uh, there should be a derivation for that. Right now it was just an observation by Born. That's a, a hit against uh, this. But what isn't stinky is the fact that it's totally baroque and crazy and wacky. To me that's not stinky. Uh, that's not a contradiction. That's not a problem. A lot of people think it is. Um, I don't think so. I think it's because of our parochial nature as we're used to this kind of conservative world. But I don't think it fits in the same way as, like, for instance, uh, conservation of uh, mass energy does. I think that's a, that is stinky. What's going on there? We need to figure that out. But no, not the, not the many worlds. Anyway, um, that's basically it. I don't know how good a job I've done because um, I kind of like this stuff. It really interests me, and I hope that uh, you like it too. Take care.